I was in the Pacific Theater on, uh, on the USS California battleship, and uh, we, uh, we could not g g have liberty and get out of the area. We had to, and we were, had to be within 24 hours of the ship. The politicians were doing something. We really didn't know what. We knew something was happening. By, by December 7th, why, uh, it, it had calmed down. I, we, I guess we thought the politicians had solved all their problems, but uh, typical they hadn't. <laughs> They've been meeting twice annually since the early 1950s, and their numbers are growing smaller with each passing year. But the South Dakota Pearl Harbor Survivors Association is still alive, alive with memories, and alive with the belief in freedom. These are the men who paid a great price for that freedom and lived to tell about it. They came from all walks of life, most from working class families, many from small towns and farms. The dirty 30s had been rough for Americans, and although the Great Depression was officially over, times were still tough, especially for young men just entering the workforce. Well, there's no opportunity to do anything, and uh, the service looked pretty good. Actually, it did at that time. There was no opportunity to do anything to make money. During the Depression, or it was coming out of the Depression at that time, but you couldn't get a job. A dollar and a half a day was top salary for a, heart, for a hand in field work like I worked in. And uh, the Navy paid 21 a month and gave you food and clothing, shelter. And there was a chance for advancement, of course, to 36 a month. So it, I just couldn't see how I could beat it. Hey, I had a cousin who had graduated in 1937 from high school, went to join the Navy, come home and told me that uh, if you joined the Navy, they paid you $21 a month, and the food was good. If you stayed in for 20 years, you got $99 a month for the rest of your life. And uh, my family had never had $99 in a month uh, that I could ever remember of, so I thought, well, that sounds pretty good to me, and uh, as soon as I got out of high school, I joined the Navy. So a buddy of mine, high school buddy, and I went down to the Navy to enlist, and uh, we asked the recruiter there how long was the, the, the time that we'd have to serve, and he said six years. Well, we went outside and talked about it. I said, well, it's a long time. Let's go over here to the Army Air Corps. We might get to fly an airplane. Well, we walked across the hall there, and it was only three years, so we signed up for the, was then the Army Air Corps, and we had our choice of where we could go. One was Panama or Hawaii, or the Philippines, well, we took Hawaii, and uh, that's how I got to go to Hawaii. For most, the military life meant security. War was happening, but only in distant places like Asia and Europe. Although some thought American involvement was inevitable, many did not. Germany was running pretty rampant over there in Europe and in Russia. And the Japanese just had a field day in China. And uh, I'm, Never dreamed about the Japanese having a nerve to attack us, so. In fact, he is, most of us, like most of the men like me, regret it, uh, really wanted to get on a first line battleship so we could go over there and show the Japanese what Americans could do, you know, that type of thing. But, uh, which is all a daydream. But, uh, we, we never, we talked about war some, but we never really. We just didn't think anybody there attacked us. We thought we were invincible. <laughs> we, we underestimated the enemy. I didn't expect it, but you never know. That was the farthest thing from my mind. <laughs> I had no idea. And of course, I had uh, three years National Guard training prior to entrance into the Army. So I knew what we could expect. But. When I enlisted, I had no idea 
we're going to be in imminent danger. <laughs> in, in 1938, uh, there wasn't even war in Europe yet. Uh, no, I, war was not uh, a question in or out of my mind. Uh, I do remember uh, in 1939, I was in night duty uh, listening to uh, a radio broadcast when a guy named Hitler uh, invaded Czechoslovakia, I think it was, and, uh, and still didn't think too much of it because that was, in those days, Czechoslovakia was the other side of the world. In fact, uh, New York City was the other side of the world almost. We didn't get around then like we do now. When you're young like that, uh, it's hard to say what you think, but uh, you didn't dismiss the possibility that it happened. I think uh, it, 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 it was there to happen. Everything pointed towards us. I always remember my instructor in high school. He said, you put a boxing gloves on a couple of kids and they fool around and fool around and slam each other. If you, he said, the first thing, they get mad at each other. And that's, uh, we was talking about the possibility of war then. But the Japanese are, they had been at war for 10 years and I've read a lot about it. They were, they were a lot better than we thought they were. Each served in his own way. The uh, aircraft uh, people like the Navy and the Army both uh, would practice dropping bombs and on us uh, for to learn how to do it, and uh, our cover, decks were covered with 12, uh, 12 timbers where the wooden decks were, and uh, they would drop these little dummy bombs on us and uh, try to hit us. And a few of them hit, and a few missed, but they were in training and learning how to how to attack uh, major vessels. We had a searchlight with a 60-inch. Parabolic, parabolic mirror, carbon arc lit, and it was supposed to emit 800 million candle power. From this position that we were strategically placed, we could search a section of the ocean out as far as the horizon. And if we uh, sighted a suspicious target, we would notify them. And, and if it warranted any further attention, why well, they would send somebody to look. That was basically our duties there. I worked in the deck division when I first went aboard there, first division. And you're up on deck and you're handling stores and you're mess cooking and whatever happens to come along. You're, uh, we had wooden decks. And you get up there and they do what they call holy stoning decks. And that's a stone that uh, they use salt water and that stone has got a, um, you got a, like a broom handle that sets down in it and you move it back and forth on the deck. And that salt water runs across there and you can get them just like snow on there. They really get them clean. But, uh, I did that for a while, and I mess cooked for a while, and then they, uh, I got put into the motor launches, boats on ship. We cruised around uh, Long Beach for quite a few months, and uh, then we went on to Honolulu, uh, Hawaii, Oahu, and uh, we were finally kind of assigned to that Pacific Fleet down there. I was uh, going to fo aerial photo school at Wheeler Field in, uh, on the island of Oahu. My squadron was over at Bellows Field. I was with the attached the 86th Observation Squadron. Day-to-day -day life on the islands ranged from monotonous to luxurious, depending on each man's perspective. Honolulu and Oahu were wonderful places prior to the war. Uh, we, we could wear civilian clothes and uh, we mingled with the community there and uh, it was, uh, the food was wonderful. After the war broke out, they didn't ask you how you wanted your eggs when you come down for breakfast in the morning. It was a little different, but uh, I never had a difficult time. We got to sleep 
even in tents, it was a good living uh, in, in Hawaii. Of course, we lived on the ship, and our liberty was what we call port and starboard. One, you, one day you was on duty, and the next week you were off, if you were in port. Uh, we were out to sea, usually, all during a week, and we'd come in maybe on Friday evening and uh, be there and ready to go out again on Monday for our training exercises. Uh, on every other weekend, uh, usually I went ashore and uh, out to Waikiki and go swimming. And that's about it. That's about all there was to do, really. They planted different crops. Of course, we didn't get to see much about that but at that time. Cane fields and, and pineapple was the main main uh, crop down there at that time, as I remember. And I enjoyed being there. It, it was, uh, the weather was wonderful, you know. <laughs> a little hot, of course, all the time. We were used to seasons at home, and down there it's, it's just one season mostly, and you, you were always sweating. It, it was a tropic. It was always warm. It was, the weather was nice and warm, but it was boring. <laughs> it, just, it was, no. <laughs> For a young man, it was boring. <laughs> day to day, uh, people in Hawaii had no use for the serviceman. Uh, you couldn't go ashore and date a girl because they wouldn't date you. Uh, very seldom did you ever see a serviceman walk down the street with a girl in Honolulu or any place around there because they just didn't have anything to do with servicemen. So uh, we go ashore, we go out to Waikiki, go swimming. We go down to the uh, YMCA and they had different functions there. You'd uh, sometimes rent a car, a bunch of you get together, rent a car, take a trip around the island. But uh, there was not much as far as social life went for servicemen out there. I was on the swimming team there for the battery, which we would go down to the gym. They had a nice pool there where we would practice. We had the inter-battery meets once a year where we could determine who were the best swimmers. <laughs> That was our, my recreation. Some of them took up boxing, some of them took baseball. And, and other than that, it was just duty as guard duty or KP or whatever arose. It wasn't what we called good duty because when you get the whole fleet and the little island of Oahu, uh, and of course we're all young men in our uh, teens and early 20s and uh, Dating girls is a is a is a is a big thing when we go ashore, and there were just weren't that many girls on Hawaii. Uh, uh, so we were always happy when we got back to the states. But uh, this time uh, we'd been out there for for uh, off and on. We 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 did exercises. You'd come in, you'd come into port, you'd be in port for four or five days, and then you'd go to sea for uh, ten days and and drill. Then you'd come back to port and get supplies and. And uh, basically, we thought we were ready for war. As it turned the way the war started, we weren't ready for that type of war, but <laughs> we were really surprised. Toward the end of 1941, some began to sense a change in the air. We were getting some restrictions because of what was happening in the Pacific. I was in the Pacific Theater on, uh, on the USS California battleship, and uh, we, uh, we could not get to have liberty and get out of the area we had to and we were, had to be within 24 hours of the ship and because we were kind of uh, the politicians were doing something we really didn't know what but uh, uh, we knew something was happening but by the time uh, the war actually by, by December 7th why uh, it, it had calmed down I, I guess we thought the politicians had solved all their problems but uh, Typical, they hadn't. <laughs> the night before, which was uh, Saturday night, I went to a dance in Honolulu at the USO, I believe it was, and 
met this young Marine there. We got to visiting and I said, well, as we left, I said, I'll see you next week here at the dance if war doesn't break out. Now, how would I know that there was going to be a war, but there'd been something in the paper to the effect that a Jap fleet had been sighted or something, but we really didn't believe it. We got into Pearl Harbor the late afternoon, I think about six, seven o'clock at night, on December the 5th, 1941. Uh, December the 6th, uh, we were tied up at the section base at, in Pearl Harbor, which is right at the mouth of the harbor. And uh, on the 6th, we just rested and ate and so I recuperated and I intended to go ashore on the 7th of December and I never did get there. We were put out in a field for sabotage protection. So they, like in the aircraft, they lined up all the planes so they could patrol them. They lined up the ships in Pearl so they could patrol them secure for sabotage. I got to riding around with the gas truck driver who was gassing up these airplanes and I said, wouldn't this make a heck of a target if the Japanese were to come in and bomb them what they were lined up so straight? Now, where I got that idea, believe me, I'm not a psychic or anything like that, but there was some talk about possibly war in the Pacific. Well, except that we've been on two, uh, two weeks maneuvers and heck, with live ammunition and everything. And, uh, and we had returned then to our chapter to demolish our, uh, our guns and so forth and put everything away on Friday. And, and then on Sunday is when they attacked. I had to watch from midnight to four o'clock. Then you go to bed and try to sleep, and boy, it's hard to sleep and everything. And then at seven or eight o'clock, why the war started. <laughs> None of the men were aware that their world was about to change forever. The first wave of the attack came in the early morning hours of December 7th. It was a Sunday morning and everyone was caught off guard. Actually, I had been in the sick bay that morning and we were getting breakfast and we heard bombs or planes coming over and we, uh, we didn't think too much about it because from time to time, planes would buzz the harbor until we looked out the port and we could see big red meatball on the bottom of the wings. And then we knew they weren't ours and the older sailors around knew the Japanese and it didn't long take long for the word to get around that we was under attack by Japanese. And from there it got pretty hectic. We wondered what was going on, the explosions. And we were wondering if somebody had an accident or a plane crashed or what did happen with all the, all the noise going on. And then there was a small arms fire. We just were stunned, I guess you'd call it. And As I was going up, the, of course I was cussing all the way up <laughs> about a drill on Sunday. And I, as I got up on the superstructure, I, I glanced over and I see this uh, smoke over there where the battleships were. They were already on fire. They were uh, fire on fire and burning and smoke as black as you could imagine. And we were in a position in the dock where we were uh, uh, looked had a broadside view of the planes coming down to drop the torpedoes on the channel between the sub base and the navy yard docks. And uh, I, one of them I seen had a red ball on. Of course, I didn't know what a red ball on plane meant at that time. Till, till somebody said what they were, they were Japanese planes. My job was there to to load 30 caliber machine gun belts. No, we didn't have anything ahead of ourselves to make anything for any uh, elongated attack. 
You know, I was on that duty. I was helping to load the machine gun belts, the 30 caliber water-cooled machine gun. And that was all ground duty. There was nothing for anti-aircraft on the machine guns. I remember general alarm sounding, and I got out of my bunk, grabbed my bag, going to my battle station, grousing, dirty, well, I'm not gonna tell you what I thought or what I said, but they didn't have to do this on, at eight o'clock on Sunday morning, you know, we didn't need another drill. Got to my battle station and, and uh, one of the other men come down and he says, I think this is a real thing. I saw a bomb drop on Ford Island. We were tied up alongside of Ford Island. And I, and I said, oh, it's not a bomb. I said, it's probably a sack of flour. And about that time, go boom, a torpedo hit our ship. And I knew that wasn't a sack of flour because when anything that makes a battleship jump is pretty big. There was a tremendous explosion and my bed seemed like it lifted off the floor. Uh, actually what had happened apparently was a bomb landing that was intended for the big barracks that we were in. They did hit the big barracks at Hickam and this one fortunately missed us. And we jumped out of bed and we looked out the window and we could see these airplanes flying by with the orange balls on them. And somebody said, it's turn the radio on to find out what's happening. And the broadcaster was saying, take cover, take cover. Uh, Pearl Harbor is being bombed. The Japanese are attacking Pearl Harbor. And that's how we knew what was going on. A bomb went off or something and I th was thrown out of my bunker. Anyway, I was out, out of there and, and uh, went running topside. And, and the Japanese were making a run on Hickam Field at that time. And the first thing I saw was a Japanese airplane at about, I'd say 15, 20 foot high and maybe 30, 40 feet from me, uh, going in, uh, making a run on Hickam Field. And I always will remember, the pilot was looking straight ahead and the gunner was looking right over at me at the tail gunner. And I dove back in our ship, it's a little wooden ship now, I remember. No guns, we didn't even have a pistol. We were waiting for orders, I guess, and uh, they put us all to work then, preparing for what might come. Like I said, I was loading, loading machine gun belts. Yeah. We each had our duties at that time. I was standing next to a porthole uh, when the attack started. I heard a bunch of noise and looked out the porthole and an airplane was coming at us, which was not unusual because they did that quite often when we were out training, but I couldn't understand what they were doing on Sunday morning and usually is out at sea, not in port. And. Uh, the airplane happened to be a torpedo plane that I saw, and I could see that it was, and I, it was a shock. Why, why a torpedo air? And the thing fell off, and he pulled up immediately. And if he hadn't, if he'd have hit the mask, he was that low, just barely off the water. And uh, he just barely missed us when he pulled up, and he, woof, and he was gone. <laughs> There's two big red dots on his wing that I noticed. And uh, I knew it right then that uh, the Japanese were attacking. And I felt the shudder of the, he, he was gone and I watched the wake of the torpedo come in and explode and it shook the ship. Uh, no big fire explosion that I saw, it just shook. There wasn't a whole lot that we could do. We didn't have guns on the old Vestal and we was, Tied alongside the Arizona, we had went alongside her to do some minor repair work. And the main target was the battleships and the combat ships in the area. But us being right alongside the Arizona put us right in the area where all the attacking was going on. We took two bombs. We took one forward and one back aft. The one back aft went all the way out through the bottom. I don't think it ever did hardly explode. It just went out through the bottom, left a big hole. So you didn't really see what was happening on land or some places where the rescue were, the worst part of it. But, uh, but it was, um, I remember seeing them torpedo planes come in at first and really about, 
Oh, it must have been 8.30, 9 o'clock. The, the high altitude bombers come in. And we can see a beautiful sunshine. You can see them up there, I guess, 20,000 feet and the silvery and, and formation. And uh, that time, they had all the anti-aircraft guns or our guns were shooting at them. Well, they sailed through and a lot of black smoke up there, but there wasn't a plane fell. <laughs> we moved out to Hickam Field, which was our uh, anti-aircraft sites for defense. And uh, on the way out to Hickam Field, we were strafed by a Japanese plane. And uh, one of our gun crews was able to set up right inside of the gate of Hickam Field, and they fired 37 rounds that day. And that's our only experience we had of actually shooting. We hurried downstairs because we're on the third floor we'd be safer on the ground floor than we were on the top floor with dropping these bombs. And we had what was called an armament shack or a little cubby hole in the barracks there where they kept some armament. And we ran in there, there was some rifles in there and a machine gun and uh, we asked the sergeant in charge there if we could have those guns. He said, well no, he said I can't release them unless I have the signature of an officer. And at that time, they were blowing up 250 some odd airplanes about 100 yards from where we were and strafing and bombing. Well, we just jumped over the counter and we grabbed the guns. And uh, we did set up a 50 caliber machine gun. But what we didn't realize after we fired it about a half a dozen times was that you got to pump water through those water cooled machine guns and the barrel burned up. And that was the end of that. And uh, I got hold of a rifle and somebody got hold of some aircraft ammunition, link ammunition. I remember this fellow standing there with a pair of pliers pulling these cartridges out of this belt and handing me there. Now I'd never fired a gun before, up until that time, well probably a BB gun, but I never fired a rifle. Now, I shoot a lot today, I'm a hunter, and we know about the element of lead, but I didn't know anything about the element of lead. And these Japanese dive bombers and torpedo bombers were flying over the top of the barracks at a speed of about 50 or 60 miles an hour, barely moving with their diving brakes down. And I would aim right at the pilot with my rifle, and as needless to say, I didn't even come close to hitting him, but that was my action that morning. You know, it's nothing like the movies. I mean, uh, there wasn't a constant roar of planes or there wasn't a constant stream of planes going over, and we spent the, most of the time looking for a plane or something like that. And a lot of times we shot too far away with the machine gun, yet you knew you couldn't hit it, but <laughs> too far away. No, it was uh, nothing like the movies. That, uh, the, the, the Japanese planes that I seen didn't make a lot of noise, and, uh, and there wasn't that steady shooting all the time. You'd wear the guns out. One of the officers that was up there said, everybody put on a life jacket and get ready to abandon ship, and which I did. And I looked over the side and saw that there's a lot of shrapnel and machine gun go fire going on. And it wasn't too far to the beach, maybe oh, probably less than 50 yards. And I thought, well, it'd be better to swim underwater. So I stepped back and took the life jacket off and threw it down. Our skipper got blowed over the side on one of the first blasts from the Arizona. And our executive officer run around hollering for us to abandon ship after we had been hit and we started settling in the stern. And our skipper swam back to the gangway, come back aboard. And when he heard that they had said abandon ship, he says, we're not abandoned ship, we're gonna get underway. And he ordered the engine room, get up steam as fast as possible. As soon as they got up enough steam where they could turn the, the screws over the propellers in the ship, why we took fire axes and cut the lines to the Arizona. And just as the Arizona's magazines blew up, um, if you ever see a picture of the Arizona with magazines blowing up and all the black smoke coming up, 
If you look real close, you see a ship pulling out from alongside of them, and that's the Vestal. And we run uh, cross channel, run her up in the mud flats. And once we got over there, well, then nobody bothered us. We was away from the combat ships. And about the same time, the lines did part due to the weight of the water in the hull, and they broke. And I remember one guy was crawling across those lines, and uh, when they broke, and we, he went flying into the air, and I don't know what happened to him. Uh, as it, and when they broke, well, it started going pretty fast, so I got up on the gunnel and just kind of got on my backside and started sliding down. And the ship was going one direction and I was going the other. It was quite thrilling. <laughs> I landed up in the water. We didn't have too much oil at the time. It was a little bit of oil and no fire, thank goodness. Uh, I was watching before I departed the ship across the island where all the battleship row was. They would start uh, getting hit and uh, Huge billows of black smoke was pouring out and explosions and airplanes flying everywhere. And some of the ships had ammunition up that they could get to and started returning fire trying to get some of them. I would say uh, our compartment flooded with fuel oil. I, I remember that and my first thought, oh boy, we don't need a fire. And that's the last thing I remember until about four in the afternoon. Uh, the fumes knocked me unconscious, and uh, for some reason or other, I ended up on a shell hoist and didn't drown in the fuel. Our compartment was about half full of fuel. Uh, somebody got down back to us, and he had what we called an RBA. It was a, a breathing apparatus with oxygen. Uh, and he came back, and he opened the hatch, and he and he. Obviously, I don't know how long he'd been there, but when we got air in there, then I, I kind of woke up. And uh, he, he couldn't get in, but he wanted me to come over to the hatch. I, uh, I didn't want to move because I, I knew I was in oil and I thought, this is slippery and I'll fall and I won't. And, and, but the more I come to, the more air I got, the more I realized I was in trouble. And finally, I took a hold of stanchions and, and uh, gearboxes, and I got over to the hatch. And about the time I got there, somebody else in the in the compartment woke up, and uh, he did the same thing. He coaxed him out, and we were the only two. There were about 30 of us in the compartment. We were the only two that got out alive. And there wasn't anything we could do except set it out and uh, watch what was going on. We could, uh, you couldn't see too much of what going on because the whole harbor was full of black smoke. But we could see ships that uh, had rolled over, ships that had sunk, and you could tell that there was a lot of damage out there from time to time. Sometime during the raid, uh, word was sent down to the USS Ash to for some volunteers to go somewhere on the island. I don't know where because that's the first time I'd ever been there. But uh, the Army was, uh, couldn't hold some Jap landing forces and they claimed that, that, so the message was that the Japanese were landing at some place and they needed some Navy or volunteers over there to help contain them. So a bunch of us volunteered, uh, not out through any heroics, I want to understood just hoping we could get a gun, you know. And uh, the uh, commander of the base, I understood, uh, called and told his general or officer, army officer in charge of that area that he had some men raised in there, and the man said, well, what for? He said, you know, there wasn't any Japanese around there. The Nevada got underway, and she tried to get out of the harbor and they hit her right in the channel going out of the harbor. And they had a young officer on the con, on the, up in the conning deck there, and uh, he gave them orders, they run to ground, keep the channel clear. Pearl Harbor is probably not one of the best harbors for defense. Everything I've ever heard was that you got a front door, you want to have a back door you can get out of in case of an attack. 
There's no back door at Pearl Harbor. There's just the front door. And if that channel is blocked, nobody gets out. And he knew that. <laughs> so he uh, run the Nevada up on the ground, kept the channel open. The members from Destroyer were making a break out of the harbor, and they couldn't have been 150 feet from me, or 200, I don't know. Because the channel is very narrow there. And uh, they were shooting right straight up, and every jet plane in the sky was trying to sink one right there because it would have been like putting the cork in the bottle. During the attack, most men were either too shocked or too busy to let fear get in the way of their duty. I think that when I become the most fearful was uh, was uh, hearing explosion in the distance. We talked about it, and then somebody, we weren't the first ones out. Somebody said, that's the Japanese are picking the ships off as they come out of the harbor. And I know we were about ready to go. It made you feel, well, you knew what a rabbit felt like when he was being shot at when you're going across the field. We were looking for a place to hide, let's put it that way, to get in some protected area. But out in that open space, there wasn't very much to hide behind. As a 17-year-old boy, you were scared and you just didn't know what was going to happen from one minute to the next. Uh, fortunately, I come out of it without a scratch. Um, we lost uh, seven of our crew when that bomb back aft hit. And went. But uh, you just didn't have time to stop and think about anything except do whatever you could to keep your ship safe. The surprising thing was that I was not afraid at the time. Uh, you know, you think with people shooting at you and bombing, you would be. I think after it was all over, you got to thinking about it, you might show some fear. But I never saw anybody act as a coward that day. Uh, probably a thousand fellows at Wheeler Field that day, and everybody was trying to help. Despite the confusion, each man helped any way he could. Then I started helping with a bunch of wounded at Hickam Field, I remember that. And they, they laid them out in a triage system in which the, there were three different rows of them. Uh, one was light wounded, which did not not need medical care at, at that time. It, then some were wounded pretty bad that the doctor could thought he could save, and then some were dying, of course, and I helped with the dying. We had one doctor and one corpsman that was just working only on those that were bad wounded that they thought they could save, and a bunch of seamen like me just doing the best we could with others. Uh, and then, uh, seemed like a lull, or maybe the Japanese stopped bombing about then when I was in that area. But quite a few of the guys were dying. We fought fires all day long. The bomb that hit up forward, uh, we had a storeroom up there that was full of rags, and that started burning. And we fought fires up there all day long. You'd think you had it out, and about the time that uh, you'd move out of there and an hour later it'd be burning again. You take a bunch of rags and bales and it's just like trying to put these hay bales out out in the field. The only way you do it is tear them apart. And so we fought fires there all day long and into the night. There was a tremendous amount of bravery because of the fact that all these airplanes were burning and bombs going off. I didn't see anybody hiding. Everybody was trying to do something. There was one of the hangars was loaded with 30 caliber aircraft ammunition, and we were carrying them out of there, those big crates. I remember, I, I don't think I could lift one today, but under the excitement, you lift them, and uh, the, they're, they're flying all over above us, and we were trying to do something. that was not much we could do, but. It was, uh, I guess you could say, exciting. Heroism was not limited to the military. 
Hundreds of civilians, caught equally off guard, helped in any way they could. And we started moving out, and uh, we could see guys coming over to, there was a housing area pretty close to where we went ashore, uh, and there was a lady out there that was trying to help people. Uh, I didn't have any clothes on except a pair of underwear, and uh, she told me, just go in and get some clothes, so I did. But she was trying to, trying to soothe these people that were coming up or were burnt. It was covered with oil and it was rest. And uh, she did just uh, a wonderful job of trying, trying to help people, doing what she could. With the end of the final wave came a new fear, fear of what was to come. Now what's going to happen? <laughs> uh -huh. And we weren't just exactly sure. We knew they, the red circle meant Japanese. But we didn't know how far, didn't have any notion of what might happen. We did think perhaps if they went that far that they would follow with troops. But it didn't happen, thankfully. Just, we were just, uh, I guess you'd say we were just stunned. <laughs> One of our airplanes had tried to land that evening and uh, no one knew who they were and everybody was trigger happy and there was a ship uh, that was moored across uh, from where we were and he started shooting at the airplane and of course the machine gun bullets penetrated the hull and got one of our crew members right there on the spot. Uh, I got off of that in a hurry. There was all kinds of rumors Japanese were landing on the beaches. They was going to come back on another attack. And nobody knew for sure what was going on. And uh, like I say, all kinds of rumors on what was going on. And you didn't know what to believe. Well, of course, it changed what I thought about the Japanese uh, uh, dramatically. Uh, we were all trying to find some kind of a weapon that we could use against these ground troops that we thought would be filtering in on us, but it never happened, thank goodness. That first night we were detailed to go in back to into Fort Shafter with our M1 rifle and surrounded the, the parade ground because they were afraid that the Japanese were going to come back and land in the parade ground. I know I worried after the attack for a lot, a lot of days about whether they were coming back or uh, what might be going to happen, you know, if they were brought a landing force in with uh, behind the planes, why we were, we were worried about that. And, and of course, every plane that got in the air was, we worried whether it was <laughs> whether it was our plane or somebody else or the Japanese. Fortunately, they didn't bring troops with us, with them. I still think if they'd brought troops with them, they'd taken over the island and we'd probably still been fighting that war in the hills. But we had nothing to fight back. We had no way of repelling them off the beach if they tried to land. I think one of the most dramatic things of the experience was that night, President Roosevelt making his speech to the Congress, and it was broadcast uh, when he talked about the date of infamy and uh, the, when he declared war. Uh, that night, which was the uh, night of December 7th, because of the fact that I had helped fire that machine gun earlier, I was an expert, and they put me on a <coughs> group of five other guys on a machine gun and we were up all night and uh, all of a sudden during the night the sky lit up like 4th of July and uh, even our gun started to shoot and I said to the fellow shooting the machine gun, I said, what are you shooting at? He said, I don't know, but everybody else is. And it was, it was just the panic and the scare and of course we didn't know where the Japanese were. We thought that there were rumors that they had already landed up on the island, which they didn't, and uh, it's something you never forget. It, it was a very exciting week 
after that because everyone was on the edge. And imagine there were quite a few rifle bullets shot that were unnecessary, and shooting at noises instead of targets. I wouldn't be here if they'd have come back a second time because they, they destroyed our fleet, you might say, and they destroyed our Air Force out there. And what we, well, what was left when the, and they, you know, I think all they lost was 26 planes. <laughs> if that had been the United States, why, we'd, have, we'd probably have a national holiday on that victory. Today, each man carries with him personal memories of the worst day of his life. We seen uh, ships like the Oklahoma roll over, bottom side up. They was, uh, you could hear people inside hammering on the bottom. They was trying to cut holes in the bottom to get to them. And they tell me that some of these battleships, when they did raise them, get them right side up and get them into dry dock and they get all the water drained out of them. They found men stacked up in the passageways where they got caught. They died right there, drowned. And uh, no way for somebody to have to go. I guess uh, when we got hit by the bomb, I, uh, in the hatch, ahead of us, it's a watertight hatch, somebody was trying to come through, so I opened it up to help him, and, and uh, I went in here, and here's a guy trying to pull two guys out. They were already unconscious from the fumes. Oil was in that compartment, but not in ours, and uh, I, I can remember, oh, we got to get them out of there, got those, and I can remember pulling them into our compartment, dogging down the hatch, and that's about the last I remember. Well, the sight as we approached Pearl Harbor, saw all this smoke and all the damage of, and what was done to the ships there in Pearl Harbor. People burnt. Uh, it's, it's an awful sight, full of oil and burnt and, uh, uh, and hatred for the people that were doing it to us. After the attack, sorting the living from the dead was often a difficult task. Well, at that time, I didn't know the death toll. We didn't know at that time. Uh, I have a, at home a, the front page of the Honolulu Star Bulletin on, from the Monday paper telling about the attack, but there were no figures in there of loss of life, and I, I don't know, it was probably quite a while before the the, 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 the wounded and the dead were, were counted. Thursday I went back up to the hospital to get my billfold and my watch that I'd left there and, and uh, they had me as killed in action. And, and uh, I didn't fi couldn't figure that out, but I found out later the reason was the, the ward I was in, the, there were so many critically injured sailors that they were dying and when they die, they haul them out and uh, take the tag off. When they found an empty bed, they take a tag off and figured he was killed. Well, I had left and I didn't take my tag, so they assumed I'd been hauled out instead of walked out. And my mother was about to be notified, but I got that stopped, so my mother was never notified that I was killed in action. My hometown newspaper, which my mother sent to me, uh, uh, I guess a couple of weeks later, had me missing in action. Well, I wasn't missing. I, they just said, no, as a matter of fact, I immediately sent a telegram to my folks, or uh, at least on Monday. When the casualties were counted, the numbers were astonishing. Of the approximately 100 U.S. Navy ships present in the harbor that day, eight battleships were damaged with five sunk. Eleven smaller ships, including cruisers and destroyers, were also badly damaged. Wheeler Field was left in ruins. Among those killed were 2,335 servicemen and 68 civilians. 1,178 people were wounded in the attack. The USS Arizona was dealt the worst blow. A 1,700-pound bomb struck it, and the ammunition on board exploded, killing 1,177 servicemen. News of the attack shocked the nation. The bombing rallied United States citizens behind the president in declaring war on Japan. 
On December 11th, Germany and Italy declared war on the U.S., bringing about a global conflict that would last for the next five years. The men had already lived through hell, but Pearl Harbor was just the beginning of a long war. I was thinking, I think a lot of us were thinking, how long is this war going to last? I know, I think one time they project how long it's going to last. I think one time after a couple of years and uh, they projected 1946. I remember one time in 1950. I thought, in 1950 I heard, I think, am I going to spend the best years of my life doing this. <laughs> and you know where we were. I was in just about a way out in the middle of the Atlantic, and that's a long ways from home. From Hawaii, we and we came back to the United States to train the 799th Cadbury. And then from there, we went back to the Pacific, to Guadalcanal, and I wound up in New Guinea. I was in a battle, uh, which was one of the one of the big battles, uh, Honolulu and four heavy, heavy cruisers were trying to stop a reinforcement of Guadalcanal with the, with the Japanese. And uh, four of the cruisers didn't get out of there, and we did. I went to a heavy cruiser, and uh, we were an escort for aircraft carrier, the USS Lexington, and we were down in the ba at Coral Sea in, in uh, oh, I think this might have been about in May of, of uh, 42. And uh, we had a, an engagement with the Japanese there. We did lose the Lexington, by the way. She was sunk by uh, aircraft fire. Yeah, but we got out and we uh, headed back up to, to Pearl Harbor. The U.S. had intelligence that the Japanese were going to invade Midway and we intercepted them, and uh, that was the first really major winning battle that the U.S. had, was the Battle of Midway, and we sunk uh, four or five of their carriers. Then I, the next battle I had anything to do with was the invasion of Iwo Jima. I was on a troop ship, and we took Marines into Iwo Jima. You've probably heard of the, uh, the kamikaze pilots. Well. Lucky old us, we got a kamikaze pilot flew his plane right into our bridge. I think mean, the scene was accurate. And uh, killed a lot of people on our ship. And we went back to the States for repairs. And while we were back at Oakland, VJ Day happened, so the war was over. We were all happy about that. The war ended and the soldiers came home. Some returned to their roots on the farm. Some went to work in the towns and cities, and some stayed in the military. Each, in his own way, played a part in building the strongest nation on Earth. David Townsend retired as postmaster of Bruce, South Dakota, having served the government for 35 years. Daryl Christofferson spent 20 years in the Navy and another 23 with the Vermilion Police Department. Ray Eiler spent 30 years as an agricultural agent in Tripp County. Gene Mahegan spent nearly 20 years in the service before starting a business in Brookings. Stan Lieberman spent his career at Ellsworth Air Force Base. David Smith became an aircraft mechanic in Sioux Falls. Steve Warren became an accountant and retired to Rapid City. Marvin Melius farmed near Falkton until retirement. Floyd Meek still farms in Holabird. In September of 2000, members of the South Dakota Pearl Harbor Survivors Association received a long-deserved honor. A section of Highway 83 was officially named the Pearl Harbor Survivors Association Memorial Highway. The dedication of this stretch of state highway is very appropriate that we can all remember. I salute you, America salutes you, and especially South Dakota not only salutes you, but we thank you. Our congratulations. Special highway signs that mark the road stand as reminders of the bravery these men showed in the face of enemy attack. They also stand as reminders of the lessons learned on that infamous day. The biggest lesson to be learned is not to cut your armed forces down to where you don't have enough to defend the country. And that's where we is at. We didn't have enough armed forces to defend the country and we got hit and took practically everything we had 
and the Pacific out. Be alert and uh, maintain a strong military force. That is probably the two most important things for this country to do. If we get weak and we get lackadaisical, we can get hit again real bad. And it wouldn't be nice, <laughs> not with atomic power. Our motto is remember Pearl Harbor, keep America safe, uh, safe and so forth. But I think our, our military is going down and, and somebody will try us again. It, and I, I feel like that we should have a very strong military force, even and hope that they, they never are used. Uh, I don't know whether we, we're capable of learning from history. Because uh, any time a nation is, in my th opinion now, any time a nation is weak, somebody's going to try to knock them off and get what they got. <laughs> Keep alert. Keep alert. That's, of course, that's the motto of our organizations that keep America alert. <laughs>